Welcome back to another episode of Offbeat Adventures. We're standing here once again on the grade of the former Canadian Northern Railway and later Canadian National Railways, Dorian and then subsequently Kinghorn subdivision. We are just southwest uh, of the community of Beardmore uh, here in the municipality of Greenstone, Ontario. Uh, we're sandwiched right between the highway, which you can see uh, uh, to my right, and then the Blackwater River, uh, which you can see to my left. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be picking up from a previous hike uh, that we did back in May of 2021 and we're going to be actually redoing uh, another hike that we did in May of 2021. Uh, and so the reason why we're redoing this is basically because there's some new information um, and um, we also want to kind of get some better footage because it is the fall time and we uh, we want to see everything with uh, the leaves down and so we can uh, basically see things uh, a lot better. So again, we are right beside the highway. Uh, so this is Highway 11. So this is the northern route uh, across this part of the province. So the highway splits just to the south in Nipigon and Highway 17 follows the lake. And this highway, Highway 11, is the more northern route. Uh, it's a little bit longer to get to Toronto, but it's flatter. So as you can see, the transports favor uh, this route. So along the way, we are going to be paralleling the Blackwater River. Uh, and so we pick up the Blackwater, the, this railway line picks up the Blackwater way back uh, just before Neza, uh, which is around milepost, uh, I think we've, the first bridge crossing is around milepost 53. We're at milepost 72 coming up. So that was 19 miles ago uh, that we basically see the uh, we basically see the river now before we leave this spot uh, this is just a quick note make sure you click on the link in the description so there's a link in the description that will take you to a 2009 Google Street View of this area and the reason why it's uh, I want you to take a look is because uh, the rails were still in place here in 2009 when that Street View picture was taken so you can actually see the grade here with the rail still in place which is obviously excuse me uh, a very neat thing to see all right, so um, we're going to get rolling here. It is a very, very crispy fall morning. Uh, it is the, uh, it is the, just checking here. Uh, I had a problem with the camera here. We recorded this segment and then got to, uh, got to milepost 72 and the camera had turned off. Um, again, it's a very crispy morning. It's the 21st of October. Uh, it's probably the coldest morning we've had so far this fall. Um, it's, uh, my phone says zero, but my truck said minus three when we got here and, uh, it's crispy. It's cold. My hang, my, I got my gloves on, skull cap, layers on. Um, so I'm, it's, it, it's chilly. Um, we've had a pretty, uh, pretty warm and pretty dry fall. And so this is the first sort of cool weather that we had. So uh, one of the reasons why we're redoing this is, uh, we want to see some of these areas in a little bit better detail here. You can see a tie. And so you can see things like this rock cut and there's going to be uh, several rock cuts that we're going to go through as we skirt the black water here. You see there's a tie plate. This rock cut is probably about seven or eight feet high, maybe, uh, maybe more in the eight foot range. Uh, lots of ties here. So you can see a couple of ties here. Um, this area seems like they had uh, quite a bit of problems pulling out the, uh, pulling the ties out of the ground. And so there's uh, lots of bits and pieces still left and you can see lots of pieces of them, of them uh, beside the grade. And see so here you can start to see it starts to peter out. So right here, just on the other side of this rock cut, I think. Um, yeah, see look, the, the water is, there's ice on the water. Okay, so uh, we do have a stopping point here, point of interest. So there's another tie right there. Got to get out my cheater notes. Hopefully this video is recording or I'm going to lose my marbles here. Okay, so um, at milepost 22.2 on the Dorian subdivision, okay, uh, which is around about milepost 71.9, which is here on the, the Kinghorn, um, there was a, a couple of spurs. So in 1939, there was a four car spur connected at the West End. So that end uh, belonging to the Johnson brothers. And then from 1946 to 1954, there was a 28 car spur that was connected at both ends uh, belonging to the Brompton Pulp and Paper Company. It was Brompton number three. Um, 
And again, that was 1946 to 1954. Um, we obviously were through here already um, once, and uh, I didn't really see a whole heck of a lot. So I'm going to flash up those timetables so you can see them. Okay, so let's head over here. We got another stop just up there because milepost 72 is up there. So this, there's two spurs. So the one was small and one was big. I don't know. Uh, obviously the Brompton one was 28 cars, so it's pretty big. You got to imagine you should be able to see something like that. And again, it's, it's a through spur, so it's connected at both ends. So, I don't know. Like, there's something here. There's a little bump out here. So, um, we're coming up to milepost 72 here. So, um, one of the things that is very common here was there's lots of logging operations along the Blackwater here. It was a very good conduit for funneling the logs um, down the river and into Lake Nipigon and eventually floating them down. So Brompton had a uh, um, had a paper mill in uh, in Red Rock. I think they also had something in Nipigon too. So here's milepost 72. So we've got a couple of things here. So obviously, first of all, the milepost marker. So the 72 is the mileage on the Kinghorn, which was the last iteration of this line. Um, there were two other iterations of this line. So the original Canadian Northern Nipigon subdivision and then the Canadian National Dorian subdivision. Uh, the mileage is different on those because the Kinghorn started in Long Lac, the other two started in Jellicoe. So in order to calculate the mileage for the original lines, you need to subtract 49.7. So the 72 becomes 22.3. Now at 22.3 in the year 1931, uh, we had, um, uh, another spur here. So somewhere in this area here, um, in 1941, there was a four car spur attached at the West end belonging to the Beardmore, uh, lumber company. Uh, so it has to be somewhere in this area and I'll actually show you, um, and it kind of ties in with the previous spur. You'll actually see, I'll show you a piece of map here from 1952 and you'll actually be able to see a collection of buildings just in this area here, right beside the river. So this was obviously one of the logging camps belonging to, uh, the Brompton company. All right, let's get rolling here. So the uh, weather forecast for today, most of them said clouds or mostly cloudy or more, more clouds than sun. Um, we we'll hope some clouds roll in because that's going to help us here because there's lots of rough cuts and things and uh, um, they're going to be obscured. Another tie here, right? You can see this one here. So there's supposed to be a, I think there's a telegraph pole. Is it here? Yeah, there's a telegraph pole, which is right there. You can see some discarded ties. So <clears throat> there's a little bump out here. There's a rock cut, but again, those spurs aren't easy to see. So yet, there's a yet another rock cut here, another piece of tie. There's another piece of tie there. So you can see this rock cut here, not particularly high. This one's maybe five or six feet. You can see more ties here. And another one up here. Heavy frost last night, obviously with the temperature falling well below zero. 
tamaracks are bright yellow. A lot of the leaves are down on the trees, which is good for us so we can see things. Um, this is uh, one of the, uh, maybe goofy is not the right word, but I, I don't like doing the hikes in this direction. You can see the rock cut continues here. I don't like, uh, we have to do this hike um, east to west and then back. So we kind of, normally we do it the other way. We go east first and then come back west. Uh, and just makes it easier for me to uh, sort of see things and then mark things. But we have to do this one backwards because there's no access. Um, there is a road, but there's a as far as I know, there's a washout on the road and you can't get in there. So here we're passing the, uh, the pipeline, which we've done quite often on our hikes. We, we do it regularly. So this is the Trans-Canada Pipeline, the natural gas pipeline that runs through this area. Oh man, it's cold. Whew. I don't know if you can see my breath on the camera. It's uh, doing a number on the batteries. They're draining fast. Like I said, that one, there must be a problem with that one battery. Cause it just, it was supposed, to, it was a brand new battery, fully charged and it just died. Where are the dogs going? So here I had seen in the previous hike, there was a piece of pipeline on the ground. I don't see it anymore. I don't know what the pipe was for. Where the hell's the dog? Here she comes. There she is. So up here somewhere is supposed to be a culvert. Okay, it's coming up in 300 meters, so unless I see something, I'll push you ahead here. So we should do our uh, usual history lesson here. Sorry, I forgot. So this railway was constructed by Canadian Northern Railway uh, between 1911 and 1914. It was going to be one of the final pieces in Canadian Northern's transcontinental ambitions. The Canadian Northern Company got its start in Manitoba way back in 1896, buying up some charters and old rail lines. Uh, their first big project was the construction of a line between the then city of Port Arthur, which is now Thunder Bay, and Winnipeg. And that line was open in 1902. And then shortly thereafter, they began uh, building lines all throughout the prairies, particularly the northern part of the prairies. Became sort of synonymous with the prairies, Canadian Northern. Uh, and then additionally, they began building north out of Toronto, same thing, uh, building some lines and some acquiring some other ones, eventually reaching up into the Sudbury area. Now, around that time, Canadian Northern realized that in order for their company to be successful long term, they would need to have a transcontinental line. Now the problem was they didn't want to build said transcontinental line because parts of it were gonna be very difficult and therefore very expensive. For example, this area. So they started looking at all kinds of ways of dealing with that, including a running rights agreement with Canadian, Nash, uh, sorry, Canadian Pacific Railway. Uh, none of that panned out. You can see a piece of telegraph pole here. And eventually they were forced to build and so um, again, construction began in the latter part of 1911 and carried them through uh, until um, 1914. So New Year's Day 1914, the last spike was driven. And the line opened for traffic in 1950. Now, unfortunately, around that time, Canadian Northern started running into some um, economic difficulties, some financial difficulties. A lot of it brought on by construction. Um, for example, they didn't want to build through this area. They did not want to build this section of railway because they knew it was going to be very, very expensive because it was long and uh, the geography was going to be difficult. And so, um, uh, you know, they, there was a very high construction cost. So by 1917, the company was basically bankrupt uh, and had to be taken over by the Canadian government. And um, in 1918, a year later, right at the end of 1918, the company was merged, amalgamated, uh, 
into uh, with a bunch of other Canadian government owned bankrupt lines into a new line which became known as Canadian National Railways and that took effect uh, at the beginning of the next year in 1990. Now it took a, a few more years till 1923 uh, for the nationalization process to be complete with the absorption of the Grand Trunk lines uh, and so uh, in 1923 the name of this line changed it became the Dorian subdivision of Canadian National Railways and continued that until 1960 when there was a big reorganization at CN. So this line, the Dorian, was merged with the more easterly Kinghorn line and the entire line became the Kinghorn running from Long Lac to at the time Port Arthur. Uh, and it continued operating until 2005 uh, when CN decided to discontinue service and um, beginning in 2008 they began ripping up the rails and that process was complete by 2000. 10. All right, so we have our first little stopping point here. So what we have is we have a concrete culvert. Um, I don't know if I can read the mileage on there. I think I tried the last time I was here. 72.18. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to hop down and go uh, take a look at that. I'm not sure if I'm going to do new footage or we're just going to rehash the, uh, the one from uh, 2021. All right, so we've made our way down to the north side of the grade and we're actually standing in this uh, small little creek here. Uh, and so here you can see the, uh, the concrete culvert. Uh, you can actually see right through to the other side. The culvert seems like it's in pretty good shape. There's not really a ton of erosion. Um, you can see they've put, uh, appears they put a little bit of rock here to keep the, the bank from kind of eroding over on the, the west side here. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, it looks like it's doing pretty good. So we're going to jump the grade and go take a look at things from the south side. All right, so we made our way down uh, on the north side. We actually have a two for one deal because you can see uh, basically the, uh, the stump, the bottom part of the telegraph pole. And so right here, we actually have a, uh, a telegraph pole right beside us. And so there are a few insulators left on there, just some Dominion 42s. There's a couple other Dominion 42s over there. Everything else looks like it's been stripped off. So likely all the good stuff is gone. So here you can see the culvert. Uh, this side seems to be in pretty good shape as well. You can see through to the other side. I don't see any uh, real displacements or joint problems in there. It's kind of funny because in lots of places you see these, uh, these concrete ones just completely messed up. And it seems like on this stretch here, uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the concrete ones are in good shape. So I guess it just... Uh, Maybe it depends a lot on the, uh, the geography and kind of what's going on. Okay, so we're going to hop back up on the grade and just uh, continue plugging our way to the west here. 